Well, good afternoon, everyone, um, and a very warm welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, I'm Stephen Hockman, the Head of Chambers at Six Pump Court, and uh, we're delighted to have your company for the next couple of hours. Um, as you know, uh, this um, is um, a webinar on the subject of regulatory issues in arbitration, with particular emphasis on environmental and health and safety regulation. Um, many of my colleagues are specialists in those fields and also some in uh, the field of arbitration law. And um, what I think will be particularly interesting about this webinar is that it will deal with the overlap or the interface between the two areas, between uh, environmental and health and safety cases and the regulatory issues arising in that context, and also with the extent to which arbitration can play a part in adjudicating upon those issues. So I'm very much looking forward to delving into those matters, as I'm sure you are. And um, can I encourage you right at the outset, um, as we go along, or at any stage, to put any questions or comments that you may have, I think preferably using the Q&A function, with which by now you'll be all too familiar. And if you put your questions in the Q&A, then we'll be able to see them and we'll try and deal with them at the end. Um, the, uh, the timing will be roughly as follows. Each of my three colleagues, uh, Charles Morgan, Gordon Menzies and Chris Badger in, in that order, will speak for up to half an hour, maybe a bit less, um, and that will allow plenty of time for questions and discussion in the final half hour. We aim to finish certainly by six o'clock, if not a little bit earlier. Um, and so um, um, it's now my pleasure to start by introducing my colleague, Charles Morgan, um, and um, I will hand over to him. Charles. A very good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be delivering the first talk. Uh, mine is extremely domestic, you could almost say parochial in nature. It's uh, an exploration of the methods by which arbitration is, is introduced by statute into environmental law with specific reference to my own particular area of specialization, which is water industry law. It's a good area to pick because I suspect that the water industry Act 1991 might appropriately be called the high watermark of uh, the variety of methods of dispute resolution which are introduced in the course of its provisions. Uh, so I shall, I hope that you have received two tables that uh, I have distributed one relating to the Water Industry Act 1991 and the other to the Water Resources Act 1991, an attempt to list in a fairly perfunctory manner the uh, totality of the dispute re resolution mechanisms to be found. Uh, and uh, we might perhaps start by looking at uh, those mechanisms in the Water Industry Act. So I shall uh, share that screen with you. Uh, I hope that everybody can now see that screen. And um, this lists the dis different dispute resolution mechanisms you you'll find in that act by the provision, rough content, type of dispute, method of resolution. The appointment of the uh, dispute resolver and the method of uh, nomination in, in the absence of agreement as to that appointment. Uh, and you'll see there is a great uh, variety. I've highlighted here a couple just, just to have a quick dip into the variety that we're going to look at in some more detail. So if we look first at uh, section 56, which uh, deals with the terms and conditions by which uh, undertakers make non-domestic supplies, 
uh, issues can arise as to the determination of those terms and conditions. And uh, the mechanism provided there is, first of all, for a determination by off what, but if off what think it's all a bit complicated, I suppose, uh, instead, they can uh, refer it to arbitration by an arbitrator of uh, their appointment. Then, if we look at section 148, uh, that's to do with um, charges that are imposed for metering works and uh, disputes as to the incidence or amount of those charges. Uh, they must be referred to a single arbitrator who is appointed by agreement or in default by off what. Then uh, we find in section 166, which is concerned with um, the granting of consent for a certain works discharges when undertakers need to um, make ad hoc discharges into watercourses. Issues can arise as to whether the consent should be given at all or whether the conditions which uh, somebody seeks to impose upon that consent are reasonable, they're to be determined by a single arbitrator appointed by agreement or in default by the president of the Institution of Civil Engineers. And then uh, in Schedule 12, which we'll look at in some detail because it's probably the most uh, uh, used in practice, uh, we have here in paragraph one, another provision for a single arbitrator by agreement or nominated by off what. But then in the next paragraphs, we find a completely different method of dispute resolution, reference to the upper tribunal. Uh, in the following paragraph, uh, we find an interesting provision where if the compensation claimed is less than 5,000, it's a determination by off what. Uh, otherwise, it's a single operator appointed by agreement or by off what. Uh, then we go down a couple of paragraphs later to paragraph six, compensation respect of discharges for works purposes. There it's a single arbitrator to be appointed by agreement or in absence of agreement by the president of the ICE. And uh, so it goes on. Uh, and uh, one is left in a sen with a sense of some mystification as to why uh, particular methods are chosen and uh, why particular uh, bodies are uh, appointed to um, resolve disputes. Some, sometimes you can um, see it as a matter of common sense arising from the nature of the dispute, but I'm not sure that that explains everything. So after that brief overview, let's look in some more detail at uh, certain uh, provisions. I'm going to start by listing the dispute resolution mechanisms to be found in the Act. The first is enforcement by off what or the Secretary of State under Section 18. And I say straight away that this isn't really a dispute resolution mechanism at all. I, I mention it for the sake of completeness. Uh, it, uh, in effect, uh, is an enforcement mechanism whereby off what uh, can enforce duties uh, directly against undertakers. I'll return to that shortly. The next method, which we've seen in the table already, is a determination by off what, including uh, a specific form of determination under Section 30A of the Act. The next form of dispute resolution to be found is determination by the Secretary of State. Uh, in a couple of instances, there is determination by the Environment Agency. Uh, in some instances, there is a reference to the upper tribunal. And in yet further instances, there is a reference to arbitration. So there is a, a complete miscellany of dispute resolution mechanisms to be found. And it's obviously very important when uh, addressing any dispute arising in the context of this act to identify fairly rapidly what the correct mechanism is and to understand something of 
how it operates. So if we look very briefly at enforcement under Section 18, because as I say, it isn't really a dispute resolution mechanism at all, it's applicable wherever the Act says uh, this is how this duty is enforced. And it's supplied by numerous provisions, and they're usually situations where off what uh, is in effect making a discretionary economic judgment about the application of uh, the finite resources of the undertakers. And it leads to the making by off what, or in some circumstances, the Secretary of State of an enforcement order. And the breach of an enforcement order is then enforceable by any person suffering resulting damage. Uh, and it is normally introduced by a complaint from someone. So in that sense, it, it's a, it's a, it arises out of a dispute. It can't be said to be a dispute resolution mechanism for the very simple fact that uh, Offward can do nothing about whatever has happened before the complaint to it is made. It can only make an enforcement order and then future breaches of that order are uh, actionable, as it were. And where it, it is available as a remedy, it is uh, usually an exclusive remedy, so that uh, there is no other remedy that the complaining party can avail themselves of. It's certainly something of a, a hot potato at the moment, and I could discourse at length about that, but I shan't. Uh, the next method of dispute resolution is determinations by off what. Now here, uh, I think it's important to be clear what we mean by determinations, because in a sense, there are there are two types of determinations. There are many public law contexts in which a regulator makes a determination vis-a-vis -a -vis the regulated entity. Uh, they don't arise in the context of any dispute, and they challengeable but normally by judicial review of the regulator by the affected regulated entity. We're not talking about those here. What we're talking about is uh, references to off what for determination of disputes between two other people, neither of which is the regulator. And uh, I've briefly drawn your attention already to an example of that in uh, section 56 relating to uh, requests for non-domestic supplies of water. Uh, section 56 is worth looking at just to, to get the feel for how these provisions appear. So section 56 says that subject to subsection three, any terms or conditions or other matter which falls to be determined for the purposes of a request made by any person to a water undertaker, for the purposes of section 65, that's a request for a supply for water for non-domestic purposes, shall be determined A, by agreement between that person and the water undertaker, or B, in default of agreement by the authority, which is off what, according to what it appears to be reasonable. It then goes on, subject to subsection three below, the authority shall also determine any dispute between any person and the water taker by virtue of subsections three or four of section 55. They are the reasonableness of uh, required expenditure or uh, any alleged contravention of water fittings regulations, which is when off what says, well, we're not giving you supply because we think you are going to connect it to something that infringes those regulations or, or sorry, the undertaker says that and, and off what is asked to uh, decided. And then we see this uh, intriguing provision in subsection three, the authority may, instead of itself making a determination under subsection one or two above, refer any matter submitted to it for determination under that subsection to the arbitration of such person as it may appoint. So off what gets the call as to, to whether to do it itself or shove it over sideways to somebody else. Uh, off what also has a, a specific set of determination powers under section 30A of the Act. And section 30A is applicable wherever the Act says it is. And 
Section 30A says that in the case of this family of disputes, practice and procedure are to be decided by Ofwat as it considers appropriate. Uh, and it requires that Ofwat must give reasons for determinations. Uh, uh, it can make orders of costs and they are final and enforceable as if county court judgments. And that's a section 30A is invoked in various provisions throughout the act. And it's generally in relation to relatively minor uh, disputes, uh, compliance with financial conditions, compliance with technical requirements, issues over the terms of requisitions for um, supplies of water infrastructure or sewage infrastructure, uh, conditions for connection to the mains, terms about metering, charging issues, things of that nature. But uh, there, uh, Ofwat has its, its own self-contained dispute resolution procedure under Section 30A. Uh, and those include uh, referrals by the Consumer Council for Water. And basically, if the Consumer Council for Water thinks that the complaint made to it, it's a sort of consumer pressure group, relates to a matter of a kind which can be referred, referred to the authority for determination under any provision of this Act, the Consumer Council for Water can refer it to off what, and it is then dealt with under Section 30A. And it, Section 30A is described as one of off what's adjudication functions in Section 207D, which is not yet in force, but uh, is, is an attempt to gather together a number of other adjudication functions and to provide for uh, the minister by statutory instrument to make provision uh, for the exercise of those functions by specified other persons, either by default or at the option of off what. So the function of section 207 seems to be yet again to um, farm out to other methods of dispute resolution yet to be decided by the minister, uh, some, some of the uh, subject matter of off what adjudication functions. Uh, one rather gets the impression that off what will uh, do the ones that it likes and shovel off the ones that it doesn't to somebody else. Uh, and you, you can find what those adjudication functions are within section 207D. Uh, but as I say, it isn't yet in force. Now, uh, what does off what do when it gets something for determination? Well, off what itself has a couple of very useful web pages which tell you all about that. So uh, the first is about complaints and disputes we can help with. And then uh, the, the next is, is about process. And uh, if you do find yourself involved in, in a determination in front of off what, uh, make your way immediately to those pages and how to proceed will become at any rate clearer. The Act also has a number of provisions which require determinations by the Secretary of State. There are two of them. And in each instance, they concern disputes between industry players. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any obvious reason why Ofwat should not decide them, but Ofwat doesn't, the Secretary of State does. The first of those is in section 37C, and that's any disputes between undertakers and water supply licensees who are the sort of new rivals of water undertakers uh, in an attempt to introduce competition into a natural monopoly. Uh, disputes can arise there uh, about the reasonable of requests by licensees to undertakers for information about water resource management plans. Those go to the Secretary of State. Uh, Similar disputes can arise in relation to drought plans. Those go to the Secretary of State. Uh, I think that probably reflects the fact that the, the, uh, any, uh, there will be inquiries about both water resource management plans and drought plans managed by the Secretary of State and PINs. And so I suppose it's regarded as the Secretary of State's province. But it just shows how difficult it is to un understand uh, where you are to go. Uh, 
so I've set out there the, the wording of uh, section 37C. Uh, Sorry, it was the other way around, actually. It's, it's the, the, the duty of the water supply licensee to provide information to the undertaker. And uh, in the event of any dispute between them as to the reasonableness of the water undertaker's request, either party may refer the matter for determination by the Secretary of State, and any such determination shall be final. And uh, no doubt, uh, if, well, it's a fact that if you go to the Secretary of State, uh, the Secretary of State will produce some uh, form of procedure which is tucked away in a cupboard to deal with these obscure forms of determination. Uh, and then uh, th this is a bit of a collector's item really, because it's a singular part, uh, provision in the act for uh, a determination by the Environment Agency. Uh, section 101A concerns uh, when an undertaker has a duty to provide a new public sewer for a locality pursuant to a requisition by local residents. Uh, and um, many disputes can arise concerning that, and uh, they are referred to the appropriate person, which is in England, the Environment Agency. Uh, and uh, th there have actually been uh, such references. I think they're not uncommon. And indeed, you can find in the law reports, uh, uh, a review, a judicial review of uh, determinations made by the Environment Agency uh, in relation to uh, an application to Anglian Water for a, a, a new sewer. Uh, so you'll, you'll see the text of uh, section 101A there. I don't think I need detain you with that. Uh, then we come to a further form of uh, dispute resolution procedure, which is the upper tribunal. Now, of course, uh, this is to the upper tribunal land chamber, formerly the lands tribunal, and uh, their forte is the valuation of interests in land in context of interference with those interests by compulsory purchase or some lesser method of um, public law interference. And uh, as I've already pointed out, we find some of uh, those in Schedule 12, where um, claims about the amount of comp compensation arising out of pipe laying activities in private land are referred to the upper tribunal. Uh, that is so also in uh, Paragraph two of Schedule 14, uh, amount of compensation following service upon an undertaker of a notice reworking of underlying mines, which is when uh, somebody who uh, has um, mineral rights in the subsoil uh, uh, discovers that uh, they, they, the uh, land that they want to work has uh, an un undertaker's apparatus above it, and they have to serve notice to the undertaker that they're proposing to undermine it. Uh, <laughs> I certainly haven't been instructed in any such disputes, but uh, they must exist. Uh, uh, then finally, we actually come to uh, provisions uh, that do refer uh, the dispute for resolution by uh, arbitration as we know it. Um, even then, there's a whole variety of um, methods. Uh, in all cases, references to a single arbitrator. There, there, there are no instances of a, an arbitral tribunal of uh, more than one member. Uh, and as you'll have seen already from the run through the table, appointments generally to be made in the first instance by agreement between the parties, except where off what is the one that decides it's going to make the reference when it can appoint the arbitrator. So in the absence of agreement, there is, there's a variety of nominators, depending on which provision you are looking at. Sometimes it's off what, sometimes it's the president of the ICE, sometimes it's the secretary of state, and uh, this is the ultimate collector's item in one instance. Uh, the upper tribunal is given the job of nominating the arbitrator. It's, all, it's almost like a slap in the face. It's, it's thought worthy of nominating the arbitrator, but not worthy of deciding the dispute itself. Uh, 
it, it, it's, it's like, I suppose, one of us being told, we don't want you to be the arbitrator, but we'd be very grateful if you would please nominate somebody who you think you would be suitable. Um, and an example of uh, nomination by Ofwat is section 56 again, uh, over domestic supplies. The authority may, instead of itself making a determination, uh, refer any matter submitted to it for determination to the arbitration of such person as it may appoint. And then in um, paragraph one of Schedule 12, uh, disputes as the amount of compensation shall be referred to the arbitration of a single arbitrator appointed by agreement between the parties or in default of agreement by the authority, which is off what. Uh, Schedule 12, paragraph 4, again, appointment by agreement or in default by the authority. Uh, and then here's an interesting one. If the compensation claim does not exceed £5,000, all questions as to the fact of damage, etc., may be referred to the authority for determination under Section 30A of this Act by either party. So your route depends on the amount. Uh, Section 150A relating to billing disputes uh, refers uh, dispute, it's not yet in force, but this will be an important new set of provisions when they come in. They refer dis, uh, consumer billing disputes, first of all, to uh, off what, uh, described here as the director, but now off what. Uh, and again, off what can either determine the dispute or appoint an arbitrator to determine the dispute. Uh, what does off what do uh, when it gets the power of nomination? Well, actually, what off what says it will do, if you go to the link there, is kick it back to the parties and say, uh, well, we think you should try and agree it rather than make us use our power of nomination. And uh, if you can't agree it amongst yourselves, why don't you go to somebody else? To get a nomination and um, off what uh, indicate that the uh, the people to whom they may uh, refer you uh, include the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CEDA, the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors, or the ICE. So off what uh, really uh, dodge their own powers there and and do everything they can to persuade the parties to get somebody else to 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 choose the arbitrator, but in the limit, if, if for some reason people wanted off what to choose, uh, they could be told they, they must. Uh, Schedule 12, uh, uh, again, uh, contains yet another version of um, dispute resolution, paragraph six, uh, uh, under, that relates to compensation in respect of discharges for works purposes. And there, the appointment of an arbitrator is in the absence of agreement by the president of the ICE. Now, Schedule 12 is, is one area of uh, dispute resolution that really is quite active because that contains in each, each of its paragraphs the mechanism for compensation in respect of very common activities by undertakers, uh, pipe laying, street works, etc. And uh, it, it's uh, extraordinary that you, you should find, I think, four different methods of dispute resolution, depending on the exact nature of the uh, works in question. And one would like to think that's because they're fine tuned to reflect the likely character of the disputes, but I'm not so sure. Uh, and then uh, here is um, the uh, exciting one where there is a nomination by either the upper tribunal or the secretary of state, and this is compensation arising out of the exercise by an undertaker of powers of entry. Undertakers have numerous statutory powers of entry, and any dispute uh, to compensation shall be referred to the arbitration of a single arbitrator appointed by agreement between the relative author relevant authority and the person who claims to sustain the loss of damage or in default of agreement by the upper tribunal where the relevant authority is the secretary of state. In other words, if the secretary of state has been the uh, entering body, then obviously uh, somebody else has to nominate uh, the arbitrator and it's the upper tribunal. Otherwise, it's the Secretary of State who nominates the arbitrator. Uh, 
But when you look at that provision, you almost think, have I misread it? And is it saying it shall be determined by the arbitration of a single arbitrator, but in default by the upper tribunal? But no, it can't be read that way. The only job of the upper tribunal is indeed to nominate the arbitrator. Um, and then uh, here's an, a, a further variation on it. Uh, compulsory of what determination if the parties can't agree. So here in section 49, which is to do with conditions of uh, making a connection to a water main uh, for the purposes of metering, those disputes are referred to the arbitration of a single arbitrator appointed by agreement between the undertaker and the complaining person, or if no agreement is reached for determination by the authority under section 30A above. So if you can't agree you are your arbitrator, you don't get arbitration at all by anybody. You get a determination by the authority under section 30A. When we finally get to arbitration, then I think all that's left to say about it is that uh, it, if, uh, you, if you've got there, then uh, procedure will be governed by the Arbitration Act. 1996, section 94 of the 1996 Act provides for its application to statutory arbitration. So uh, at that point, uh, we all heave a sigh of relief. It all becomes familiar again. And uh, we know uh, what the rules are and how exactly the procedure will go. Uh, the other forms of statutory re resolution, all the ones I've looked at, uh, have a life of their own, uh, a procedure of their own, and a status of their own. And of course, also, crucially, uh, different means of challenge. Uh, in, 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 uh, you, you won't have the statutory challenges provided by the 1996 Act. You will simply have um, challenges uh, by um, judicial review of the public law decision making that is uh, constituted in the uh, determinations. I, I'm just very quickly going to mention some other acts. The Water Resources Act uh, has, a, uh, I've, I've given a table there too, but uh, it's, it's got a slightly less disparate mix of nominating parties. It's either the Secretary of State or the President of the ICE, depending on which provision you're looking at. Uh, the Electricity Act has an important section, section 23, uh, making provision for determination of disputes. It's widely applied by references throughout the Act, and where it is, a dispute is referred to Ofgem and the industry regulator, and Ofgem can either make its own determination or, if it thinks fit, appoint an arbitrator. Uh, the Gas Act has essentially similar wide-ranging uh, general provisions for determination of disputes. Uh, with again uh, Ofgem being the first port of call and Ofgem being permitted to kick it off to an arbitrator. Health and Safety at Work Act, since we're talking about health and safety at work, the word arbitration does not appear in the Health and Safety at Work Act at all, but I'll leave it to Gordon Menzies to tell you all about uh, the other respects in which arbitration does uh, have a part to play in the world of health and safety, which I must confess is a closed book to me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Um, extraordinary range of possibilities there. Um, and I don't suppose even you with all your expertise uh, could explain why that variety exists or whether there's any rationale to it. But uh, that may be something to come back to in the questions. Remind everybody to, uh, Put questions in the uh, in the Q and A. There don't seem to be any there any there at the moment. But um, in the meantime, looking forward um, to uh, wait a minute. One has popped up, um, so we'll come back to that. Um, thank you to that questioner. And uh, in the meantime, we're looking forward to hearing from Gordon, um, who I think will um, sort of move the focus more towards the arbitration space itself and um, uh, um, uh, some uh, issues arising in that context. So, Gordon, over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Health and Safety in Arbitration. Um, this uh, part of the lecture concentrates on 
the consequences of regulatory intervention in the health and safety context for parties who are uh, parties to an arbitration uh, agreement. Um, and as you uh, can appreciate uh, that uh, what we have, well, we have various um, uh, options and various scenarios where uh, health and safety issues may arise, uh, which lead to uh, disputes being adjudicated by arbitration. First of all, you may have your enthusiastic health and safety inspector who uh, attends a construction site, uh, serves a prohibition notice, leads to temporary delay. There may be uh, an incident where the uh, enthusiastic contractor challenges uh, a prohibition notice. And of course, as we all know, prohibition notices, the effect on them is not suspended pending challenge. And unless you can reach an alternative accommodation, uh, pending the two years or so that it'll take you to get in front of an employment tribunal, uh, that can of course lead to extensive uh, delay. You might also have sustained regulatory intervention leading to termination of the activity itself. Um, recently, there was a sustained intervention by Australia's health and safety authorities into oil and gas platforms located offshore of Darwin in Australia to the extent that uh, the operation had to close. Its infrastructure was uh, aging to an extent that actually the measures required of them were simply not economic and the company had to go into administration. And then finally, you might have, indeed we have had, uh, legislative intervention uh, based on health and safety uh, on a national scale. And I'm thinking, uh, particularly of um, UK measures to uh, combat the recent pandemic. But of course, you can uh, appreciate immediately how that uh, will certainly uh, play in the international context uh, of arbitration of international commercial agreements. So those are the kind of scenarios that uh, we are looking at. And there's three particular contexts that I want to focus on. First of all, domestic arbitration. Secondly, international commercial arbitration and investment treaty arbitration. See how uh, those kind of scenarios may feed into those particular contexts. But before we do, um, let's just have a look at a few general uh, propositions, general principles. Um, when you are choosing your arbitrator, if health and safety goes to the heart of uh, the issue, then of course you will want to um, focus your choice on people with relevant experience. Likewise, if uh, there are technical issues, uh, experts are going to be considered. But less obviously are issues such as confidentiality. Now, it's often assumed that arbitrations are confidential, in the vast majority of cases they are. But uh, a word of caution is uh, necessary because confidentiality, certainly as far as English law is concerned, is implied as part of the arbitration agreement. But different states have different national approaches. For example, Peru, Australia, Scotland, all have very clear, well-defined uh, confidentiality provisions imported as a matter of national law, not simply as a matter of um, incorporation by implied terms. Also note different institutions have different approaches. The ICC, for example, has um, an approach based on confidentiality uh, for the centre, its staff and the work of the arbitrator or the arbitrators, um, while the LCIA has a much more developed set of rules which relate to confidentiality, which actually extend to the parties. So hence, when you come to agree the terms of reference for an arbitrator with um, uh, all the various uh, matters set out, confidentiality is something that you're going to have to consider. And remember, confidentiality is subject to exceptions. 
Uh, Section 20 of the Health and Safety Work Act uh, disclosure requirements under that is one obvious one. But also remember this, there are general exceptions framed around the public interest. And in this case there, Westwood Shipping, where disclosure by one party to an arbitration was sought uh, to use in uh, associated proceedings involving others. Uh, they were seeking to bring an action for unlawful means conspiracy. So you can immediately recognize that if you have uh, associated uh, proceedings with either a third party or a regulator which are linked to the arbitration, then you may want material to be, to be disclosed from uh, the arbitration proceedings that you can use in the context of other proceedings either involving a regulatory authority or a third party. So that is uh, things to be aware of as far as confidentiality is concerned. Precedent is uh, another issue to be aware of. In arbitration generally, there is no doctrine of binding precedent. Arbitration is out with uh, a legal system which imports such concepts, particularly in the common law system where it's very much a centre stage and civil law systems less so. But in the context of arbitration, um, relevant uh, precedents can be treated as of a persuasive authority, if not binding authority, um, but much will depend on the context. Sports arbitrations rely on uh, previous awards and are treated um, uh, with considerable care. I won't say the amount of precedents, but certainly there is an established corpus of previous authority which they can and do rely on in that context. In the context of international uh, arbitration, uh, precedents are less commonly relied on. Parties will uh, seek to put them in front of the arbitrator and it's very common for arbitrators to refer to them, but um, less so than another context, particularly sports arbitration. Investment treaty arbitration, for example, precedent actually does um, play uh, a bigger role because there are many previous awards which consider issues of substantive protection like fair and equitable treatment. So again, there is no doctrine of binding precedent, certainly as a matter of strict technical accuracy, but in practice, uh, that is something which you can, should and will rely on um, in the context of these kind of disputes. So that brings us to the first of our specific context on establishing general principles and looking at domestic arbitration. And you can readily appreciate in the health and safety context that um, it is likely to involve such things as delays in construction uh, contracts and health and safety issues which lead to delays in that context. Now generally delay due to safety issues will be treated as an excusable event or lead to excusable delay. Um, it can be well appreciated how one contractor uh, waiting for safety fencing to be installed by the principal contractor cannot be held to be in default as far as uh, the principles of construction law are concerned. However, what concerns us in this particular context is what happens when safety issues arise as a result of regulatory intervention. And this will depend on where the parties have allocated their risk in the context of their particular agreement. But in order to assist, and this is a good example because it follows um, an approach which is reflected in many other standard construction uh, contracts. And this comes from the JCT uh, Design and Build 2016 standard terms. And it uh, talks about relevant events, relevant events being uh, events which give rise to claim for extension. And we can see there clause 2, 2612, uh, a relevant event includes 
be exercised after the base date by the United Kingdom government or any local or public authority of any statutory power that is not occasioned by a default of the contractor or any contractor's person, but which directly affects the execution of works. So the exercise of a power by a local or public authority of any statutory power, so clearly that would cover the HSE, um, that is not occasioned by default of the contractor or any contractor's person. So um, what does default mean? Are we in a position where the contractor having cheerfully uh, successfully challenged a prohibition notice or improvement notice, which has caused a uh, delay. Is he to be met by a plea by the employer or developer to say, well, well done you, but actually you are still in default. Is default wider than the grounds for legitimate regulatory intervention? Um, and there are some useful principles or arguments for you to consider when trying to wrestle with this particular issue. For example, uh, default arguably could be synonymous with negligence. Um, there's a case there, Costello in Calgary. It's a Canadian case, but it has been cited in this jurisdiction in a certain contexts, particularly for our purposes, the context of commercial contracts. So again, that's something to consider. And of course, as the health and safety lawyers amongst us uh, will start thinking, well, if default is synonymous with negligence, is negligence coextensive with um, that touchstone for regulatory intervention failure to take all reasonable practicable steps? Would negligence be coextensive with reasonable practicability? Um, something that the courts always seek to shy away from, but of course, those of you that are familiar with Baker and Quantum will know that it was suggested uh, and it was emphasized, this was an, an obiter basis, that as far as common law duties of negligence compared to the statutory duties that we're all familiar with in the Health and Safety at Work Act are concerned, the difference is only one of burden of proof. So that's one particular aspect to think about. Um, but of course, if that's the case, then we run into the uh, concern raised in the HATM case, which is, well, this was said in the context of foreseeability. If that's the position, then is that not impermissibly introducing civil concepts of fault by the back door? But it seems to me that there's certainly um, good scope for a contractor to argue that actually, when there's talk of default in the standard terms, that is coextensive with justifiable regulatory intervention if I can show that they have not properly uh, exercised their powers or if they have exercised their powers on the wrong basis um, in the context of an arbitration, then I am not in default as per the contract and therefore um, I am not liable um, for whatever remedy may be sought in the context of a construction arbitration. So moving swiftly then on from domestic to international, um, one of the hot topics for international commercial arbitration is uh, the agreement to arbitrate. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with arbitration in general, uh, you will, may not be aware that different laws apply to different facets of international commercial arbitration. You may have the law of the seat, i.e. the law of the place where legally the arbitration is taking place. You may have the law which applies to the contract as a whole. And we'll all be familiar with looking towards the end of the contract and seeing the governing law provisions. And then there's the law of the arbitration agreement itself. Now, it may be that the arbitration agreement is located in the same document as the contract. It may be it is just one clause amongst many, but it is treated as separable uh, 
and requires separate consideration. So Gordon, why is this all relevant uh, to health and safety? Well, the reason it is relevant is illustrated by a case called ENCA, because depending on which law uh, applies to your agreement to arbitrate, uh, that will affect um, what disputes are actually arbitrable, what disputes can actually be subject to arbitration in the first place. And ENCA was a very good example of that because it concerned a fire at a power station which had been built in Russia. And uh, the subcontractor uh, was blamed for this fire. The insurer uh, issued uh, legal proceedings in Russia saying um, this is a matter which is not subject to arbitration and I'm going to sue you in Russia. Um, and uh, the subcontractor said, well, no, hang on, this is to be dealt with by arbitration. Um, we have an agreement that the arbitration will be conducted in London. And therefore, I say that English law should apply. The crux of the issue is that if Russian law applied to the agreement to arbitrate, then that only um, Russian law only recognizes that uh, pure contractual disputes can be properly uh, and legally arbitrated. If there is a, a tortious element to it, if it can be characterized as tortious as well as contractual, it's not purely contractual, then that's not an agreement which in Russian law can be subject to arbitration. And that's why the Russian insurers were saying Russian law applies to the agreement to arbitrate and therefore this kind of dispute does not fall within those provisions. Therefore, we are off to the Moscow High Court and good luck to you there. Um, uh, the Supreme Court, however, were having uh, none of this and held that English law applied to the agreement to arbitrate. Therefore, um, this particular dispute fell within those dispute provisions and therefore the arbitration should proceed. Um, the crux of the case was that uh, although the contract ran to hundreds of pages, there was no governing law clause for the contract as a whole. So what law applies to the agreement to arbitrate within that document? And uh, as you will expect, uh, the judgment was long, it was detailed, there were two dissenting judgments, um, it was, on any view, a fraught decision. But the key passage for you to concentrate on is it's paragraph 170 of the judgment. And there are two principles there. Where the law applicable to the arbitration agreement is not specified, the choice of governing law for the contract will generally apply to an arbitration agreement which forms part of the contract. So that seems fairly straightforward. In the absence of any choice of law to govern the arbitration agreement, the arbitration agreement is governed by the law with which it is most closely connected. Where the parties have chosen a seat of arbitration, this would generally be the law of the seat, even if this differs from the law applicable to the party's substantive contractual obligations. And that was exactly the case in ENCA. The parties had chosen a seat um, in London, and therefore, because there was no uh, express or even implicit choice of um, uh, the law for the contract as a whole, then that left um, the law of the seat as the law had the closest connection with the agreement to arbitrate, and that was a law that applied. Um, but again, it's um, a decision which bears close consideration because there's some fine distinctions about in, implying an agreement uh, to have a particular law as a governing law and imputing one, um, but that is a lecture for another day. Next point is an in international commercial arbitration, what happens if the law changes? What happens if the regulatory environment changes? Well, here you again look to your terms and uh, the FIDIC forms and uh, make specific provision for this. Provided that a change in the laws of the country which affects the contraction, the performance of its obligations, 
may give rise to entitlement to both an adjustment of the contract price and an extension of time. So there's a contractual basis there for um, being able to go to the developer if uh, health and safety provisions change, which uh, change the landscape to the extent they actually may need an adjustment to the contract price or extension of time, or at least might uh, seek to use that as an attempt to uh, adjust the contract price. Um, of course, what we are faced with uh, in certain international commercial arbitration terms is quite a unique situation in the context of the global pandemic. Um, that changes can change the ball game uh, quite considerably. So what kind of general principles will be brought into play um, in international arbitration when a contractor is seeking to avoid um, any uh, issues arising out of failure to perform as a result of the pandemic? Well, if you go to civil law jurisdictions, you may be able to rely on principles such as hardship, uh, France, for example, um, where the economic imbalance between the parties from the event in question is excessive, um, whether the risk was allocated, if not, what is required to correct the resulting imbalance. So again, that's a principle uh, which can be used uh, in French and other uh, uh, civil jurisdictions. Force majeure, of course, um, we look at it in terms of contract, um, uh, other jurisdictions, uh, civil jurisdictions, look at it as a freestanding principle. Again, the FIDIC forms um, uh, set out a test there for force majeure, but it's important to also recognise that even jurisdictions, civil jurisdictions, which have hitherto been reluctant to recognise pandemics as force majeure, and particularly France, uh, are now uh, open to this particular argument uh, in the context of um, COVID, where they weren't in the context of, for example, Ebola, in a, for example, Ebola previously. Um, frustration and impossibility. Um, again, we all know from our English law, if we're dealing in an English arbitration, that the arbitrator will probably follow English law principles to the extent that that's a very high standard and that's reflected again internationally um, interestingly in california they have um, a frustration type principle uh, based on impracticability which is uh, certainly a little more flexible but um, uh, is a lone voice in amongst the rest of the u.s legislation and that takes us uh, to the final um, element investment treaty arbitration and the issue uh, I want to look at in the context of health and safety is fair and equitable treatment. This is a substantive standard of protection for an investor who is a party to uh, a state uh, investment treaty. Um, and the origins of this aspect of fair and equitable treatment that I want to look at lie in a case called TechMed and Mexico which appeared to suggest that the state's sovereign ability to legislate to actually change the regulatory landscape may be circumscribed by what's called fair and equitable treatment. Now, as you can imagine, this is hugely controversial, given that uh, on one hand you have, yes, a legitimate um, need for investors to be able to operate on the basis on which everyone agreed and expected them to operate when the deal was done. But on the other hand, laws do change and it is inherent in the state sovereignty that a state can do that. Um, so the more recent case rather than TechMed to uh, concentrate on, on is El Paso in Argentina. And it states this, when applied to the legislative function, the standard provides a measure of regulatory stability for the investor, especially where the state has accorded him specific assurances as to the regulatory framework on the basis of which it induced him to invest. Where the impugned measures operate in an arbitrary, 
or discriminatory fashion or where they virtually eliminate the reasonably anticipated value of the investment. In assessing legislative measures, the tribunal must weigh the effect of the investor, the effect on the investor with the host state's ability to amend its regulatory framework over time in the public interest. So the key point to take away from there is that there has to be a requirement for a specific insurance, a specific assurance. And that's something that Chris is going to pick up in a moment. Another case to look at, Total, Total in Argentina. The evaluation of the fairness of the conduct of the host country towards investor cannot be made in isolation, considering only their bilateral relations. The context of the evolution of the host economy the reasonableness of the normative changes challenged and their appropriateness in the light of the criteria of proportionality also have to be taken into account. Two issues there, proportionality, perhaps an obvious one, but also um, the um, context of the evolution of the host economy. It's a case uh, involving Albania and the point that was made is well, the regulatory environment in Albania was so backward that you cannot have uh, realistically expected not to change. Uh, it was going to have to improve as, as a matter of simple regulatory evolution. So when we talk about changes in health and safety standards, if you're operating an environment where the standards are already poor, it's going to be very difficult to complain if they improve to an extent which is more in line with the recognized international standards for health and safety. So what you really need, three elements there, specific assurance, um, you need action which is arbitrary or discriminatory, and really you're looking for a total alteration of the entire regulatory framework for foreign investments. So health and safety legislation, yes, could potentially uh, meet um, these three tests, but it's going to have to be of uh, a fairly um, a wide order, fairly heavy order in order to do so. And of course, the best example we have that of the fairly stringent uh, health and safety measures as a result of global pandemic. But it's going to be very difficult to argue that even those are very wide and have a huge effect, it's certainly not arbitrary or discriminatory in the effect they apply to all and um, not something which is likely to be covered by a specific insurance to begin with. So the way you deal with this, uh, three ways to deal with it, freezing clauses, you fix or freeze applicable domestic legislation or economic uh, equilibrium clauses, you get an indemnity if the law changes or hybrid clauses, combination of both, investors may be granted an exemption or indemnified instead. So that's the way you deal with those kind of issues uh, that raised in uh, treaty arbitration. So that concludes the romp, uh, if I may say so, through those three contexts. Um, but as you will readily appreciate, um, the health and safety issues that may arise in those three contexts of arbitration are by no means um, uh, straightforward. So um, by all means, go forth and, and litigate and there's plenty of scope for importing the health and safety principles with which we are all familiar into these contexts. So um, uh, thank you. And having touched on legitimate expectation, et cetera, I can now pass over to uh, Chris Badger, who's going to, in his talk, take up that particular uh, baton. Thank you very much indeed, Gordon. Um, fascinating stuff. And um, now we're going to move slightly back to the to the uh, to the environmental field with um, a presentation by my colleague uh, Chris Badger uh, on the interface between um, environmental law or environmental law in the arbitration context. Chris, over to you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I thought I'd take a a quick canter through environment issues in. Uh, investor state disputes, so international arbitration involving investors and states. Um, I mean, investment arbitration has been dealing with, I think, what can be termed environmental issues for decades. Uh, they, uh, it's no stranger to environmental issues that can include bans on various chemicals, it can include disputes over mining permits, for example, it could include disputes over renewable subsidies, uh, to name but a few. 
Uh, but what's interesting now is, I think, the emphasis on the achievement of some form of environmental improvement. Uh, investor state dispute resolution is seen as an essential tool to attract the substantial amount of investment that is required in order to be able to transition to a sustainable circular economy. And states have committed uh, to the Paris Agreement, to making finance flows consistent with a pathway towards low greenhouse gas emissions uh, and climate resilient development. And both uh, public and private actors have to change investment flows uh, radically away from high emitting projects, particularly fossil fuels, towards projects that are carbon neutral uh, or low emission, uh, such as renewable energy. Uh, and I mean, this can manifest itself in a number of ways. One of the interesting ways, which is, which is currently being developed, are uh, uh, the, the drafting of the various investment treaties. I mean, for example, the 2016 Morocco-Nigeria bilateral investment treaty explicitly defines an investment by reference to that investment's ability to contribute to sustainable development. So as I say, enhancing sustainable development was a key tenet of whether something was an investment or not. Um, but it's worth also just highlighting one one word of caution when it comes to investor state disputes, because there is always the potential for states to forego radical policy change in favour of the status quo for fear of being on the wrong end of disputes. Um, and, I, and I'll try and highlight that as we go through some of the cases. But there, there's always a risk that the statement that the system favours incumbents and it can make it difficult for states to make uh, what they might consider to be the necessary changes, uh, particularly where investors have been led to believe in the security of the status quo. Uh, so in this context, I thought it would be interesting to highlight a few cases relevant to environmental regulation. Uh, perhaps we can identify some of the current and, and interesting trends uh, in environmental arbitrations. So the first one is to uh, pick up a topic that Gordon highlighted, um, uh, and that is legitimate expectations. So the case is Green Tech uh, and Novan Energy against Italy. Um, Italy had, in this case, made express assurances uh, that there would be no amendment to financial incentives in the form of tariffs. So here we were dealing with electricity being generated from uh, photovoltaic plants uh, and the, the assurances that were effectively given by the Italian state was that incentive tariff premiums uh, would uh, not only exist, but they would remain fixed for two decades. Uh, and uh, in fact, what happened in practice was that um, the state moved away from that guarantee. It changed uh, effectively the, those tariffs. Uh, and the tribunal held that the assurances that had been given by Italy effectively amounted to a waiver of any right to reduce the value of those tariffs, despite the fact that host states retain the sovereign prerogative to amend their laws. <clears throat> so a good and clear example uh, of uh, legitimate expectation and express assurances uh, being held to bind a state in its future conduct. Uh, the next case to, to draw to your attention and just discuss a little is Vattenfall in Germany, which is a long running dispute that was only uh, settled in March of 2021. Uh, Vattenfall was a Swedish limited company. Uh, it brought an action against Germany after uh, the German state fundamentally changed its position on nuclear power following the Fukushima accident uh, in Japan in March 2011. Now, in essence, this was a case about whether the owners of nuclear power plants should receive compensation for shutting down plants prior to the end of their economic life once a democratic decision had been made to end nuclear power generation. Uh, and it was essentially uh, an allegation that the state had unlawfully expropriated the investments of the claimants through its change in policy. As I said, the case has been settled. It's reported um, that there's been an award of some one and a half billion euros. Uh, 
Um, it's interesting because it's an example of a change in uh, energy policy resulting in a compensatory payment being made to an investor. Um, but the principles that sort of underline the case, um, I mean, they, they may well have been one of the factors uh, that was at the forefront of the German state's mind when it was considering what action it should take over Nord Stream 2 and, um, and whether or not that pipeline should have been shut down in light of the uh, Russia-Ukraine war and the impact that that would have on the fossil fuel companies that were effectively behind the implementation and the financing of the pipeline. Um, so uh, that may have proven to be a consideration that led to some dithering and delay in what action that the German state was actually going to take. So the impact of a change in energy policy, uh, particularly important, um, especially in, in the context of environmental considerations, when one's looking forward to the future and, and developing uh, pathways towards net zero. The next uh, topic uh, to touch upon is uh, concerns arbitrary state behavior. Uh, it's a case called Crystallix and Venezuela. Um, Venezuela attempted to deny a mining permit on the basis of serious environmental deterioration in rivers, soils, flora, fauna, biodiversity, which they said was caused by uncontrolled mining activity due to the presence, high presence of miners, uh, generating passive or environmental damage that negatively affected the ecosystem with unpredictable consequences. Um, but this, this followed some four or five years of, of really quite impressive engagement between Venezuela uh, and the investing companies. Uh, and despite that, the permit denial letter was a mere two and a half pages long. But there wasn't any question that Venezuela had the right and indeed the responsibility to raise concerns relating to, for example, global warming or environmental issues or biodiversity. But what was the subject of criticism and was the key issue on which the case turned was the manner in which these concerns were put forward uh, and uh, the lack of transparency and consistency demonstrated by Venezuela. And the case really turned on that principle of fair and equitable treatment. And it's, it is an interesting uh, award to read and to read the discussion of how that principle should be interpreted. Um, ultimately, it's very fact specific, but, the principle of fair and equitable treatment includes not only protections of legitimate expectations, but also protection against arbitrary and discriminatory treatment, uh, against transparency and consistency. And, um, and in this case, the investing company uh, had spent millions of dollars on reports that were effectively summarily ignored. Uh, and the tribunal held that the company's time and effort and engagement and the money that it had spent on those reports entitled that company to have those documents properly assessed and evaluated. And it simply wasn't open to the state to summarily uh, dismiss them. Um, the next case, Santa Elena in Costa Rica, uh, is an example of what might be described laudable direct expropriation. Uh, in this case, uh, international law permitted the government of Costa Rica to expropriate foreign owned property within its territory for a public purpose, providing that there was a prompt payment of adequate and effective compensation. And it was held that expropriation for environmental reasons could be classified as taking for a public purpose. But no matter how laudable the public purpose was, no matter how beneficial to society the reasons behind the expropriation were, that wasn't a ground to reduce the level of compensation payable. So a, a good example of the very commercial nature uh, of these disputes, that the obligation to pay compensation remained and there was no grounds to reduce the extent of that compensation, even though the expropriation took place for sound environmental reasons. 
Uh, the next case concerns the concept of the level playing field at Selena and Serbia. Uh, it was an arbitration taken due to an alleged failure by Serbia to enforce its own legislation uh, on the treatment of animal byproducts, which jeopardized the viability uh, of Energo Zelena's operations in Serbia. They ran a rendering plant that claims to be the only one that fully complied with legislation. Uh, and effectively, by law, uh, remains of meat and bones and carcasses should have been disposed of at Zelena's facility. But Poor enforcement meant that tons of waste ended up going to landfill, which meant that uh, those that were um, under the various regulations to, to, to dispose of the waste in a particular way managed to avoid significantly higher disposal costs. Uh, and that, that failure to enforce uh, was claimed uh, and indeed found to lead to of discrimination, uh, unfair competition on the market, uh, and indeed there was the suggestion that the, the, that the failure to enforce had endangered uh, the, the citizens of, of, of Serbia and other countries and breached international obligations. Now, um, according to the Belgrade uh, magazine Neen, uh, Zelena were ultimately awarded around 40 million euros, but the, the, the judgment of the award itself is not public, um, so I haven't been able to, to specifically look at the award itself. Um, in any event, I mean, you would anticipate that a failure to enforce on such a scale is likely to be rare. And, and the case, I think, is a surprising one. I mean, how often will it be that lack of enforcement is so bad that it becomes actionable? But uh, at least uh, domestically in the UK, there's an interesting parallel uh, with the advent of the Office for Environmental Protection, because part of the OEP's mandate is to examine the implementation of environmental law in the UK. And so um, one of the questions that arises is, is, is in considering failures of public bodies to properly implement environmental law, is that going to provide an information source uh, that might be used by companies in commercial actions against the state? Uh, the next topic, uh, covers two cases and it's and it's counterclaims. So the first to draw to your attention is the case of Avon and Costa Rica. Um, Avon and others have purchased land on the Pacific coast of Costa Rica with a view to developing a tourist site. There were allegations of environmental damage to protected wetlands uh, and the claim uh, that was brought by Avon was that when the local authorities issued injunction or injunctions, I should say, against, uh, against construction works, that in doing that, Costa Rica had indirectly expropriated the claimant's right to the value of their investment without any compensation. The counterclaim brought under the terms of the relevant trade agreement was, was essentially as follows, that whilst the claimants were aware of the ecological nature of the site, they had disregarded their legal responsibility to preserve it and they had continued harmful activities that had damaged the environment. Now, critically, um, the jurisdiction of the tribunal to hear the counterclaim at all was challenged, but that challenge was unsuccessful. It, it was possible, it was both admissible and justiciable in this case, to bring a counterclaim for environmental damage caused by an investee company. Where the counterclaim ultimately failed was due to a lack of precision in the statement of facts and insufficient evidence brought by Costa Rica to prove the alleged environmental damage in question. But that doesn't detract from the fact that the counterclaim uh, was very much permissible. The second authority um, is that of Burlington and Ecuador. Um, it's a case that really centers on, on again, on, on unlawful expropriations, the use of a windfall tax. Uh, in this particular case, of the imposition of a windfall tax, even one amounting to 99% of profits, didn't amount to an unlawful expropriation as it still preserved Burlington's capacity to generate a commercial return, albeit a much smaller one than they had envisaged. Um, 
Ecuador were found to have expropriated Burlington's investment through the entry into and occupation of oil fields, which occurred after Burlington stopped paying the relevant tax. And as a result of that expropriation, there was an award of some uh, or nearly $380 million. But environmentally, uh, the case is interesting because Ecuador launched a counterclaim for soil cleanup costs, uh, groundwater remediation costs, uh, and costs to return infrastructure to a good condition. And whereas the decision on liability ran to 183 pages, this part of the arbitration is another 469 pages in the award. Uh, ultimately, uh, environmental harm was found to be defined by reference to regulatory criteria. And so harm could only be found if relevant permissible limits had been exceeded. There wasn't any ground, for example, to go back you know, hundreds of years before, before any work had ever been undertaken to a pristine environment. Environmental harm was only that over and above permissible limits. But nonetheless, uh, the counterclaim was successful to the tune of 40 million pounds, 40 million dollars. Uh, and there you have it. Um, a brief run through through some of uh, perhaps the most uh, interesting uh, and, and influential environmental issues that are currently uh, the subject of investor state disputes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And um, although you were too modest to mention it, perhaps I could mention that your recently published book, um, which you wrote together with Professor Richard McCrory on um, on the OEP and its powers and its uh, uh, remit going forward um, is, I believe, now available at um, all good legal bookshops. And um, no doubt uh, any of our audience who would like you to sign their copy would um, yeah. uh, you'd be you'd be willing to do so, um, hopefully without diminishing the value of the book. Um, right. Um, well. Um, a fascinating um, series of talks from different perspectives. And perhaps for those of us who practice in environmental and health and safety law, whether um, domestically or internationally, it comes as no surprise to find that uh, increasingly such disputes are finding themselves um, being referred to or being involved with um, arbitration as a dispute resolution mechanism. It's obvious, really, when you think about it, that um, mm -hmm that such mechanisms are very likely to be suitable rather in the same way as inquiries can be uh, domestically um, for the resolution of such disputes. And increasingly, I think we're going to find ourselves involved in dispute resolution mechanisms of that kind. Now, we've got two or three questions at any rate, which we can put to the panel. We'll have, shall we, um, a fairly crisp um, question and answer session. Um, it's, a, it's a warm and sunny evening and people may eventually decide that uh, there are alternatives to um, focusing on these fascinating topics. But let's just deal with the questions that have been raised. And um, if we can first come back to you, Charles, um, a question about uh, your um, detailed presentation on the um, water Industry Act. Um, and the questioner wonders whether the arbitration processes that you've described could be classified as mandatory arbitration. And um, is that somehow inconsistent with the principle, which I think is uh, very often thought to be fundamental to the concept of arbitration, that consent is necessary for an arbitration to take place? I don't know whether you could just comment generally on, on that. Yes, it's a very interesting question. It raises some quite fundamental issues. Uh, the answer is yes, essentially the arbitration process is mandatory. And it seems to me that the reason for that is that the uh, contexts in which these disputes arise are, are, are all to do with uh, 
fairly sophisticated concepts of access to uh, public systems of, of utilities or, 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 or infrastructure, where it's not at all clear that any justiciable dispute at all would arise in the absence of the uh, dispute resolution provisions provided for in the Act itself. I suppose another way of putting that would be to say that uh, it's Parliament saying, well, uh, you, you only get uh, the right to enjoy the fruits of this public utility uh, on these terms. Why would Parliament say that? I suppose because it's felt that the, the disputes are often of a technical nature best addressed by somebody who is well versed in the field in which they arise and to whom the context is familiar. Whereas if the disputes were allowed to go to court, I think the two fears would be one, they might be very numerous, and two, they would be raising issues with which uh, the judicial mind would be largely unfamiliar. And I think possibly three, with which most judicial minds would not wish to be troubled. I hope that answers it. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to congratulate the questioner on the on the question and comment that um, yep. I think um, we've we have in front of us a possible further um, seminar or webinar on the whole issue of um, consent in relation to arbitration. I think we could probably explore that issue at some length, but uh, as I say, uh, on a sunny evening like this, now is probably not the time to open up that subject. But I've got a feeling that it might be interesting to to look into it. Um, right, now, um, a question that's been suggested, which is probably um, relevant to your talk, Gordon, concerns the subject of precedent and whether uh, the fact that arbitrations are generally confidential uh, really inhibits um, the development of any form of um, collection of or database of precedents. Um, or even whether it inhibits, I suppose, um, the application of the doctrine of precedent. I mean, clearly, um, we do know the outcome of some arbitrations. Um, we've heard about some of them this evening, but just on the, the subject in general of precedent in the context of arbitration, um, a subject which lawyers will inevitably be interested in, your comments, I think, would be helpful. Yes, it it, it it's surprising for a system which uh, avows itself as being divorced from a system of precedent, relies on it um, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on the context. And it's also um, quite unusual how much material there is actually out there. Um, anyone who's used the Clure database knows just how much you can get hold of, uh, which makes it all the more frustrating when there are things you know out there. Um, Chris referred to uh, reports of one particular case, but not actually able to get hold of the award itself. So now there is um, uh, there is a practice of relying on it despite confidentiality, and there's clearly a significant amount of material out there despite confidentiality, <laughs> which allows. Um, uh, practitioners to rely on cases and uh, arbitrators will take them into account. So certainly, yes, confidentiality doesn't help, but it certainly hasn't stopped um, people using uh, uh, past awards and certainly arbitrators uh, do um, acknowledge them. So yes, it, it's it's an unusual contradiction, but certainly it hasn't stopped that practice. There's um, an article by a chap called Daiwan, Pulkit Daiwan, in which he argues that actually, well, confidentiality, first of all, 
uh, may be compromised in certain situations and is not unqualified. And perhaps he would argue, well, he does argue that perhaps uh, not all elements of an award should uh, retain their um, cloak of confidentiality. I have real problems with that because uh, going back to the consensual nature of arbitration, when you agree the terms of reference, you will agree what is or is not to be confidential. And I, I, I find that argument actually quite difficult to accept that in some way, the need to have uh, a doctrine or precedent outweighs uh, one of the fundamental attractions of arbitration, A, that you can, um, it's a consensual process, and you can decide what is confidential or not. Thank you. Um, and now um, there's a question for Chris, I think, um, uh, because um, you've talked to us this evening about um, environmental issues, uh, which have been the subject of arbitrations. Um, of course, um, um, litigation involving environmental issues um, is also proliferating at the moment, perhaps particularly in the context of disputes flowing from the phenomenon of climate change. We haven't really touched on that so far this evening, but do you see any parallels between the growth of um, arbitrations involving environmental issues on the one hand and the growth of litigation involving environmental issues such as climate change? Well, certainly, I mean, certainly the rise in greenhouse gas emissions has led to an increased frequency and diversity of legal actions addressing climate change. Uh, and that includes, that includes those that are premised on regulatory responses to greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, an obvious example is the Dutch case of Agenda, um, where the Dutch Supreme Court found that the government was in breach of um, Articles 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, and consequently its duty of care to its citizens, um, by putting in place a domestic policy with a target for emissions reduction that was below that to which the Netherlands had actually committed by virtue of its international agreements. And so I, th I think it is inevitable that where governments have committed to a policy choice, such as Paris or such as net zero, uh, that the practical steps that are to be put in place to reach that target will inevitably come under increasing scrutiny. Uh, similarly, private companies are the, are the same, the Friends of the Earth took an action against Shell, and that demonstrates that companies are not immune to legal challenges for their approaches towards reducing CO2 emissions. So I think it's inevitable that as policy comes under pressure and, 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 and the focus is very much on environmental improvement, that there will be disputes, parallel disputes arising in the commercial arena, uh, most probably between those that are the higher emitting organizations and states that are seeking to reduce emissions, but, but not exclusively. Um, and, and that can potentially have very interesting and important consequences for environmental policy, particularly if a state is, is forced to change its policy, that can, that can conflict or at least impact upon uh, climate change initiatives. Uh, interesting, picking up on a point that, that Gordon referred to, this is one of those areas where confidentiality isn't necessarily, a, a, from an environmental perspective, the best element or aspect of arbitration, because you, you, know, you might want these decisions to be uh, much more focused on, uh, on the public domain and, uh, and, and those sort of wider environmental public interest elements rather than very narrow commercial interests. Thank you very much. Um, well, uh, as I said, given, um, given the, um, the weather and uh, other uh, relevant environmental factors, um, I think this is probably the time to bring this uh, webinar to a conclusion. I'd like to thank Stephen, um, I wonder everybody. If, Sorry, John. I wonder, I wonder if, if I can just um, keep everybody hanging around for a while, uh, having mulled over the, the, the question that Gordon answered. Uh, what's yes. intriguing me is, suppose there was no confidentiality at all. How would a system of precedent work? <laughs>
Uh, I can understand how it works in a system which is hierarchical as to um, importance of decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, we also have the rule in English law, I think that if one High Court judge decides a point one way, and a second High Court judge, not bound by that first decision, decides it another way, then a third High Court judge can choose between them and reach a decision, following which the point will be regarded as settled at High Court level. But I can't see how even that would work in arbitration, unless um, you had some sort of invidious system of um, hierarchy between arbitrators. So, you know, um, mm. members of the RICS were, were at one point in the hierarchy, uh, judicial arbitrators were at another, et cetera, et cetera. How, how would precedent work between arbitrations? And because it's a summer evening, uh, what I can do is I can invite you to relax in your garden, Charles, which I've been in, which is a wonderful garden, in your deck chair with a glass of beer in one hand and Poolkit Diwan's article on the other, which not only will address that issue, but will also uh, tease you with uh, descriptions of the evolution of the doctrine of precedent in common law systems as opposed to civil systems. So um, it would be too easy to answer that question without you uh, reading, reading the article. What a very satisfactory answer in the circumstances. Thank you, Gordon. I look forward to receiving a PDF of it from you immediately after we go. Well, um, thanks to all the speakers. Thank you to our audience uh, for sticking with us. Um, we can promise you more intellectual excitement, um, perhaps not before the summer, but certainly in the autumn. I'm sure we'll be doing more webinars on environmental and health and safety law, and indeed, on arbitration as well. Our arbitration team continues to be strong and active and um, planning something on sanctions law, um, among other things, to, um, to entertain you if that's uh, an issue that's of interest to you. So, um, as I said, I'm very grateful to everyone for their participation um, and um, have a good evening and hope to see you again soon. Goodbye for now. <laughs>